Hi, this is Ms. Delosier, and this is a quick review over ecosystems. Most of this is going to be review, but hopefully we're going to expand on your knowledge from ninth grade. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is the levels of biological organization. You should be familiar with these levels. Uh, basically, all this is saying is that um, cells, which are the most basic um, level of biological organization. When you have cells that combine together, they form tissues. Um, and we're going to go from smallest to largest here. So that's our smallest uh, at the cell level. So cells uh, group together to form tissues. Cells of the same type group together to form tissues. Tissues group together to form organs. Organs group together to form organ systems. When you have several different organ, organ systems present working together, they form organisms. So moving on from that, once the organ systems group together to form our organism, then we're talking about individual living creatures. So when we have a group of organisms of the same type living together in the same place, we call that a population. Um, so we have the population of humans in Louisville. We can have the population of polar bears uh, in Canada. When you are looking at all of the populations in an area, we call that the community. I'll normally say the biological community, so you're clear that I'm talking about the biological community and not like the community of Louisville or the community of Flower Mound. Um, and then an ecosystem, which is really what I want to be talking about today, an ecosystem is really just adding in the next level to it. So we'll go ahead and we'll define what an ecosystem is. The ecosystem is the largest level that we're going to look at today. There is a level above ecosystem, which is the biosphere, which is kind of everything on the entire planet, but we're not going to talk about that today. So looking at an ecosystem, an ecosystem is just defined as all of the, organism is, all of the organisms in a community plus all of the abiotic factors in a community. And when we talk about ecosystems, we need to focus on three things. How does the ecosystem capture energy? Which means, how are um, the producers actually capturing the sunlight and converting it to a chemical form? And for almost everything that we talk about all year, that's going to be producers, um, are going to be our plants, and they're going to be capturing the sunlight and converting it into a chemical energy form through the process of photosynthesis. And that chemical energy form is going to be sugar. Moving on from there, once I've got the energy captured, how do I transfer it from one organism to another organism? So then we bring in the consumers. So consumers have to obtain that energy. So the energy is going to be transferred within the ecosystem from one level to the next, from producer to primary consumer, primary consumer to secondary consumer, on up the food web. When we're talking about the consumers transferring energy, we're actually talking about the energy being transferred from one organism to another. I do want you to remember, though, that the plants are fixing the energy into a chemical form for the plants to use. So don't forget that the plants don't just do photosynthesis, the plants are then going to take that energy in and use it for cellular respiration because plants grow, plants reproduce, plants have to carry on their metabolic processes and that's what they're making sugar for. They're not making sugar so you come along and eat them. Um, once we have the energy transferred, then we've covered the energy side of an ecosystem. Now what we need to talk about is how do the organisms in the ecosystem cycle the nutrients. So energy is transferred. The matter in an ecosystem is recycled. And there's four different cycles that we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on any of them right now because we're going to talk about all of them uh, at more length in class. So the first one that we're going to talk about is... Um, the water cycle, because I think you're all fairly familiar with the water cycle. Um, the next one is the carbon cycle, and the carbon cycle involves the plants taking the carbon dioxide out of the air, fixing it into glucose, and then us as consumers taking that glucose, breaking it down into ATP, and then ultimately through several metabolic processes during cellular respiration, it's going to be broken back down into carbon dioxide and it re-enters the atmosphere. So that's the carbon cycle, the photosynthesis and the cellular respiration. Don't forget, plants do cellular respiration too. Very important. 
And then the other two cycles are the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. And we're not going to talk about any of them right now. You just need to know that nitrogen cycles through the environment, and that involves bacteria. And we'll talk about phosphorus in class. Um, we're going to talk about nitrogen in class too. So moving on from there, I want to go ahead and I want to look at, at these pictures of food pyramids and food webs. And I know that you've seen pictures of food pyramids and food webs before. So this is a really quick and dirty review. Uh, I've highlighted the plants green um, for obvious reasons. My plants are my producers, also known as my autotrophs. They're going to do the photosynthesis or capturing the sunlight, converting it into chemical energy in the form of glucose, and that is going to be the basis for our entire food web. Now, you'll notice in our pyramid, the plants form the base of the pyramid, and there's a reason for that. We put them at the bottom because there's the largest number of plants in the ecosystem. Like they make up sheer number wise and mass wise, they make up the bulk of the ecosystem. They also contain most of the energy present in the ecosystem. Think about it. If there were fewer plants than there were insects and herbivores, the insects and all the other herbivores would eat all the plants and then the entire food web would collapse. So the plants have to form that base. If you have an ecosystem where the base, where the producers are not um, outweighing the rest of the pyramid in biomass, then you're, you're looking at a special situation where they've got a very quick reproductive rate, or you're looking at a situation where you have an ecosystem that is collapsing. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna circle my plant in green, that's my tree. By the way, these are trophic levels. I'll refer to trophic levels a lot. Um, and just so you know, when I say trophic levels, I mean like producer, consumer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. I'm just talking about what level it is in the food web. So the next one is gonna be primary consumers. My primary consumers, in this case, it's an insect, a squirrel, and a bird that's turned on its side. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to highlight those in blue and I'm going to go through my food web and I'm going to show the paths of the plant, the tree, moving, being consumed by um, into each of those primary consumers. So I'm showing the flow of matter and energy through these lines. Now they're supposed to have arrows and they don't, um, but obviously the tree is not eating the insect. So. I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw the lines in the direction that the energy is flowing. So the insect is consuming the tree, so is the squirrel, and so is the bird. So those all get blue lines. The next level is going to be my secondary consumers. My secondary consumers are the second level outside of the plant. So it goes plants, primary consumers, secondary consumers. So my secondary consumers, I'm highlighting in yellow, and I'm gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing with the lines, except I'm gonna use yellow for my lines this time. So the squirrel is consumed by the snake. The um, insect is consumed by the snake. The insect is consumed by the squirrel. So that means that the squirrel is acting as both a primary consumer by eating the tree, and it's also acting as a secondary consumer by consuming the insect. So you, just because you're a primary consumer some of the time doesn't mean you're a primary consumer all of the time. I, for instance, had a salad today for lunch that was made up mostly of lettuce, but it also had chicken on it, which is made of chicken. So I was both a primary consumer um, eating the lettuce, and I was also a secondary or tertiary consumer, depending on what they actually fed the chicken. We would have to do some research on that. Uh, additionally, the uh, frog is consuming the insect, so it is a secondary consumer, and the fox is consuming that bird, so it is a secondary consumer. I'm going to draw the arrows on because it's driving me crazy. So after that, we have our tertiary consumers. Those secondary predators that I highlighted, those are tertiary consumers, which means third level, right? Um, so everything that has a pink line connecting to it is going to be a tertiary consumer. So, oh, I forgot to move the squirrel into the fox, which would make the fox a secondary consumer there also. There we go. All right, back to the pink lines. Uh, pink lines. So I need to go from all of my secondary consumers to my tertiary. So I can go from the snake to the fox. So the fox is going to be a tertiary consumer. And then I could also go from the frog to the snake. So the snake would also be a tertiary consumer, which actually makes the fox more like a quaternary consumer because I could go tree, insect, frog, snake, which would be third, right? Uh, fox for my fourth level, quaternary consumer. Um, and that's 
that's showing that. I forgot to write uh, tertiary consumer there. So tertiary consumers. The other thing that we have showing on this food web are my detrivores, which are my decomposers. And you all know that decomposers break down the dead matter and they recycle that matter back into the soil. So they're, they're helping complete that, that cycle of nutrients. Um, now, if you look at the food web, there's some lines going to the fungus, the insect, and the worm. And it's a little iffy what's going on there. Like, is that worm actually consuming the tree? Is that insect consuming the tree? I mean, is, is the tree being eaten or broken down by that millipede? Um, yes, probably, because I mean, the tree's not eating the millipede, right? Um, and that's probably a true statement for that earthworm too. But the rest of those, it gets kind of confusing. Is it saying that the frog is eating the millipede and the worm, or is it saying that the worm and the millipede are breaking down the frog? And if it's saying that, how come the worm and the millipede aren't breaking down the insect and the, the bird? So normally in class, when we're looking at food webs, we just don't put the decomposers on because it creates way too many lines. So normally we'll put them off to the side and we just label them decomposers. But I wanted you to see them on the food web. So you understood that they can get very confusing. The next thing we're gonna look at is, oh, why? Why is it that I, I have that, that quaternary um, consumer, my fox on there? Like, why, did, why is he not in the pyramid? He is in the pyramid, but I've got him labeled tertiary consumer. So why is it that we don't actually regularly label um, quaternary um, and above? Like, why don't I have fifth level consumers and seventh level consumers on this pyramid? And here's why. We said that most of the energy is at the plants at the bottom, right? Which means the least amount of energy is at the top of the pyramid. Um, and the reason that we don't have any levels really above fourth or fifth ever in any ecosystem is there's just not enough energy. It's such an inefficient transfer of energy that you really can't go through more than really four or five levels of transferring the energy. Because if you do, you're just not you're not getting enough energy transferred per level. So we're gonna talk about that. And, and I bet you guys remember that transfer of energy. So the rule of 10%, right? So in general, when you have a primary producer being eaten, when you have a plant being eaten by an herbivore, about 10% of the available energy is being transferred. Um, and that, that holds true for each of those levels. So you have 10% being transferred at each level. Now what that means is that if I started with 100 units of energy and I pass 10 units to the primary consumer, then I'm only going from 10% of 10 units. So I'd be passing one unit of energy to the secondary consumer and then 10% of one, so only 0.1 unit of energy to the tertiary consumer. And I'm generically calling it unit because we're going to do the math on this in class so you don't freak out on me. Um, but I do need you to understand that there is an energy loss. It's not really a loss, and we're going to talk about where it goes in just a second. But there's an energy inefficiency in the passing of the energy up to each trophic level. So this is the rule of 10%. We call it the rule of 10% because in general, it's 10%. Um, so in general, 10% of energy is transferred. It's not actually 10%, you guys. It's normally 5% to 20% depending on the organism that you're talking about because different organisms are going to have different metabolic processes so they're going to have different levels of energy. We just generalize 10%. And here's my question, why? Why is only on, on average 10% of that energy being passed up? Well, think about it. The tree is not just sitting there making energy to transfer to you all day every day. The tree is making energy to go ahead and conduct its normal processes. Its normal processes like reproducing so it can continue to exist as a species, um, growth, and metabolism. I mean it has to go ahead and conduct photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires energy. Well, that energy comes from the sun but it's not its only metabolic process. It does other metabolic processes like cellular respiration which uses sugar. So those processes are all going to have some type of inefficiency in them. So they all use energy and the thing that we need to talk about is during all of these processes, we have to remember 
that no process, law of thermodynamics, right? Second law of thermodynamics, no process is 100% efficient. So there's always going to be, I'm not going to put 100% in and get 100% out. There's, so there's always going to be some energy lost due to heat. So because there's always some energy lost due to heat, we always need to take into account the fact that... Um, that that heat is is a factor in all our metabolic processes. And sometimes this is a problem because like when we look at cellular respiration, yeah. cellular respiration is all of these little tiny steps because otherwise the heat loss would be too massive for us. But at the same time, if we didn't have a heat byproduct from our metabolic processes, like touch your face, it's warm, you wouldn't be able to maintain your core body temperature. You as an endotherm are going to actually lose more of your your energy um, to heat loss because that's part of how we work, right? That's part of how our bodies function. We maintain homeostasis. We thermoregulate by taking all of that heat loss and actually kind of turning it to our advantage. I maintain body temperature by burning off energy. Now, does that mean that there's a little furnace inside of me burning energy? No, it just means that my cellular processes use energy, they're not 100% efficient, heat is produced, and that helps me maintain my, my body temperature. Now, when you get too cold, your body actually does do things to increase the metabolism to go ahead and speed up that heat production. So that's just a really quick review. Um, I hope that's helpful.